Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Echo Tango Echo voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 1 september 2016. Dit is het bulletin van donderdag. Vandaag is er Mosche en een SSTV beeld in, let wel, PD120. Het is de payload van de ballon van de ballonvossenjacht in 2013 plus een insert met een close-up. De afgelopen week werd ik door flink wat mensen getipt over een artikel dat ging over een buitenaards signaal dat ontvangen werd. Het bericht bevatte redelijk wat onjuistheden en dat maakt het is komkommertijd wat voorzichtig. Volgens verschillende versies van het artikel zou de organisatie CETI bijvoorbeeld onderzoek doen naar het verschijnsel. CETI is echter geen organisatie, het is de Amerikaanse afkorting voor het onderzoek naar buitenaards leven. Het bericht met een flinterdunne basis verscheen in deze komkommertijd op ongelooflijk veel plekken en ook op diverse amateurwebsites. Vandaag werd bekend dat het Russische signaal, waar het hele bericht op gebaseerd was, bij nader onderzoek toch niet uit de ruimte afkomstig was, maar van een bijzonder aardse storingsbron. Voordat ik aan opnieuw een Engelstalig onderdeel begin, eerst nog een paar korte mededelingen. Nog tien dagen en dan is de ballonvossenjacht alweer. Die komt met rassenschreden dichterbij, dus poets je pijl, ontvangers en antennes op en zorg dat je voldoende slaap krijgt en in topconditie bent. Het L7 zendt tussen de middag momenteel weer de serie Last Man Standing uit. Dat is de Amerikaanse primetime sitcom waarbij meerdere mensen in de serie zich met de zendhobby bezighouden. Ja, Ten slotte, ik streef ernaar om vanavond weer een beetje bij te zijn met de uitzending online plaatsen. Het eerst zal dat lukken met YouTube. Ook vandaag is de uitzending iets langer dan anders. Binnenkort zitten we weer op een minuut of 7 aan 9, wat het gewoonlijk altijd is. Normally all of our weekday bulletins are in Dutch, but due to the lack of news we temporarily do our weekday bulletins partly in English. During weekends the daily minutes are in English, with amongst others the propagation bulletin for the next week and some DX news. The SSTV image is in PD120 today, normally it's mostly in PD90. You can pick the picture up, for example with your smartphone using the microphone, using the Robot36 app on Android. Today's picture is of the payload of the balloon fox hunt, which will take place September 11. I think this is one of the coolest features of today's smartphones. It knows up from down. Built into the circuitry is a tiny device that can detect changes in orientation and tell the screen to rotate. Now, let me show you uh, what it looks like using an old iPhone. There it is. It's an accelerometer. I'll tell you how this kind of chip works and how it's made, but first some basics of accelerometers. They have two fundamental parts a housing attached to the object, whose acceleration we want to measure, and a mass that, while tethered to the housing, can still move. Here it's a spring with a heavy metal ball. If we move the housing up, the ball lags behind stretching the spring. If we measure how much that spring stretches, we can calculate the force of gravity. You can easily see that three of these could determine the orientations of a three-dimensional object. Well, lying with a z-axis perpendicular to gravity, only the ball on the x-axis spring shows extension. Turn this on its side so that the z-axis points up and only the accelerometer along the spring on that axis stretches. So how does this phone and this chip measure changes in gravity? Well, more complex than the simple ball and spring model, it has the same fundamental elements. Inside the chip, engineers have created a tiny accelerometer out of silicon. It has, of course, a housing that's fixed to the phone and a comb-like section that can move back and forth. That's the seismic mass equivalent to the ball. The spring in this case is the flexibility of the thin silicon tethering it to the housing. Now, clearly, if we can measure the motion of this central section, we can detect changes in orientation. To see how that's done, examine three of the fingers on the accelerometer. The three fingers make up a differential capacitor. That means that if the center section moves, then current will flow. Engineers correlate the amount of flowing current to acceleration. This accelerometer fascinates me, but even more amazing is how they make such a thing. It would seem nearly impossible to make such an intricate device as this tiny smartphone accelerometer. At only 500 microns across, no tiny tools could craft such a thing. Instead, engineers use some unique chemical properties of silicon to etch the accelerometer's fingers in H-shaped sections. Now, to get an idea of how they do this, let me show you how to make a single cantilevered beam, like a diving board, in a small chunk of silicon. Empirically, engineers noticed that if they poured potassium hydroxide on a particular surface of crystalline silicon, it would eat away at the silicon until it forms a pyramidal-shaped hole. This occurs because of the unique crystal structure of silicon. To make a pyramidal hole in silicon, engineers cover all but a small square with a mask impervious to the potassium hydroxide. 
Now, it only etches within the square shape cordoned off by the mask. The potassium hydroxide dissolves silicon faster in the vertical than in the horizontal direction. This is why it makes a pyramidal hole. Now, to make a cantilevered beam, engineers follow these steps. First, mass the surface except for a U-shaped section. At first, the potassium hydroxide will cut two inverse pyramids side by side. As the etching continues, the potassium hydroxide begins to dissolve the silicon between these holes. If we wash it away at just the right point before it dissolves the silicon just underneath the mask, it will leave a small cantilevered beam hanging over a hole with a square bottom. Engineers make smartphone accelerometers using these same methods, but as you can picture, it takes a series of detailed masks to create the intricate structure of a smartphone accelerometer. While complex, a key point is that the whole process can be automated. This is absolutely essential in the miniaturization of technology. Engineers now make all sorts of amazing things at this tiny scale. Micro engines with gears that rotate 300,000 times a minute, nozzles in inkjet printers, and my favorite, micro mirrors that focus light in semiconductor lasers. I'm Bill Hammack, The Engineer Guy. This video is based on a chapter in the book, Eight Amazing Engineering Stories. In the 17th century, this amount of nutmeg would buy you a large house. I bought this for about three bucks at the grocery store. The Europeans thought that nutmeg had powerful medicinal properties. In fact, it was so rare that the English and the Dutch fought wars over it. They decimated a small Indonesian island that was a sole supplier of nutmeg. It seems quaint to us that an economy should depend on a rare spice from an obscure part of the world. But our economy works in exactly the same way. Um, our electronics depend on a um, tantalum. This is a Motorola Q phone. It's a smartphone. It has the smallest QWERTY keyboard. That's a typewriter keyboard. And my wife loves it because it fits her fingers. In a way, this is made possible by tantalum. Tantalum comes from the minerals columbite, tantalite. They're so often found together that we abbreviate the name to coltan. You can see that it's a hard blue-gray metal. And it's as magic to us as nutmeg was to the Europeans. Let me show you where it is in the cell phone. Now, the U.S. actually has no sources at all of coltan. Australia makes about half of the world's uh, supply. About 2% comes from the Congo in Africa. And there, it decimated the Congo, um, much like nutmeg did in the 17th century. In fact, some people estimate that it killed about 5 million people. There we go. Now, look. You can see just a little yellow blob here. That's a tantalum capacitor. It regulates the voltage, and it stores energy in the cell phone. Now, you could make the capacitor out of aluminum, but that would make the, the capacitor a lot larger. And in a cell phone like this that has all sorts of bells and whistles, you want everything as small as possible because that makes everything very cheap. Even though this is just one yellow blob and it doesn't seem like much, a cell phone has about mm, 40 milligrams of tantalum in it. Multiply that by, say, 40 million cell phones, and you can see how you have a lot of tantalum used up. But it's not only this cell phone. All sorts of electronic devices, like this PlayStation 2, have tantalum in them. Hello? Yeah, hi, hon. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know where the uh, nutmeg is. Actually, I have it at work. I'm using it um, to make some of those videos. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Your, your cell phone. I, um... I, I don't know where your cell phone is. Uh-huh. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald.